There lived a very interesting and kindly old gentleman who is known as the Venerable Bede. He is called Venerable because he was on his way to canonization, but he never got any further than the first step by which he became Venerable as one of these terms that precedes full canonization. Now, the Venerable Bede was uh, a very pious soul, and he had a great sorrow in his, in his heart, something that he just could hardly bear, and that was to contemplate the motion of a pagan heaven over a Christian earth. Here were all the constellations, here was the Argonaut sailing off, here was Cetus the great whale, here were all these symbols, Hercules and Pegasus and Ariadne and all this, all moving over a perfectly respectable Christian commonwealth. It just didn't seem right. So the Venerable Bee decided to Christianize the heavens. And he did it. And we have in the library two very beautiful astronomical charts, very large ones, original prints from the Middle Ages in full color showing the Christian universe. He did it very simply. He simply took the various constellations and transformed them. The crator or cup of the Greeks became the Holy Grail. The twelve signs of the zodiac became the twelve disciples. Nothing could be simpler. Uh, Cetus, the great fish, Leviathan, became Jonah's whale. And the Argonaut kept on sailing as Noah's Ark. All these symbols were perfectly fitted together. And the result was a great success. But suddenly everybody stopped in their tracks. Somebody had let the cat out of the bag. Actually, the symbolism proved the common origin of both groups. Actually, these symbols that were put in the place of the old, were the equivalents in a new faith of identically the same principles. So everybody hushed it up and forgot about it <laughs> until the French Revolution came along with still a different idea and the situation has lapsed back, waiting now for another revolution on the part of scientists who probably will want to change all of these because they can't stand the superstitions of any group. So that... Uh, uh, now you don't speak about planets and uh, not plan uh, speak about signs. You speak about so many degrees of right ascension. It's so much less personal and so much more scientific, but it comes out to the same place. <laughs> also, astrology is now giving uh, way to a kind of new science, which is going to be called cosmography or something of that nature, in which they are going to do something that was never heard of before. They're going to consider the possibility that the heavens influence the earth. <laughs> but they're going to do it with a new name, and the right man is going to discover it, which is very, very important in our times. <laughs> but this concept of the universe, again, shows much that tells us of the old ways and of the old concepts and rites. In the old days, the initiation rituals of the temples always followed, in some mysterious manner, this astronomical pattern. Apuleius, for example, in the Metamorphosis, describes his own initiation into the mysteries as far as he can. Then he says that to preserve his vows he must be silent. But he does explain that at one degree or part of the rite, this candidate is enveloped in a blue cloak, covered with stars and constellations, to indicate that he is being lifted up into the higher parts of the universe. Epulius also tells us that in one of the degrees of the mysteries, he beheld the sun shining under his feet at midnight, which is a very interesting point, looking very much as though somebody knew something about the astronomical theory, because theoretically at midnight, that's approximately where you might expect it to be. Also, he describes the rituals, and uh, he follows very closely the description given by Porphyry in his Cave of the Nymphs, which is an interpretation of one section of the Odyssey of Homer. And he describes the cave of initiation, in which you descend under the earth, 
and come into a room, the ceiling of which is made to represent the sky. And there are two entrances, one on each side, and you descend a set of steps. You walk across a common ground and ascend out to another set of steps. And the, the point of uh, entrance into this underworld is called Cancer. And the point of exit is called Capricorn. And the adventures, wanderings, and terrible experiences of the candidate seeking initiation represents the motion of the sun through the signs Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. Now if you can imagine placing Cancer at one gate and Capricorn at the other and going down now, uh, to the point between them, you will find you have sort of tipped your celestial globe so that now the bottom point is represented by the sign of Libra, which is now between the two. <clears throat> Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra. Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, you're out. So that Libra is placed at the center in the bottom. The sign of Libra is the scales. Here the soul, descending into the underworld, comes into the judgment hall of Osiris, where his consciousness or his conscience is weighed upon the scales in the psychostasia. The ancient peoples only had a zodiac of ten signs at one time in a very remote period. They had no sign of Libra, and Virgo, Scorpio were one sign. And that is still indicated by the general shape of the two, except that in one the end of the M-like figure turns up, and in the other it turns back. Now at the time of the so-called fall of man, it was believed that the signs were divided and Libra was inserted between them. There is a very ancient doctrine about that. Increasing the number of the signs to twelve. But the sign of the scales placed in the judgment hall of the twin truths in the temple of Amentet is at the bottom of this V-like pattern of the descent of man into judgment or into generation. This judgment or testing in the mysteries follows very closely the entire cycle of ancient times and the ancient initiation ritual. Now there is also a very interesting story relating to the human embryo. For if the embryo is twisted inward to form its equivalent to a circle, the embryo which has at the beginning, as you realize, a caudal appendage resembling a tail, looking very much like a highly developed polywog, this structure, if twisted into a circular form, equals three quarters of a circle. In other words, it takes nine twelfths of a circle to do this. But there is, there are three signs or three parts of the circle that are not touched. The head and tail of the figure do not meet. Therefore, this occurs to us in our Old Testament symbolism under the story of the broken wheel. And this broken wheel, or the nine-twelfths wheel, is again an astronomical symbol that has played a considerable part in human thinking. Because the nine-twelfths represent the nine months of generation or the period in which the child is being formed. The three missing signs, or the broken spokes of the wheel, or the missing rim of the wheel at that point, fulfills the rites of the Eleusinian Mysteries. For the Eleusinian Mysteries were given in two sections, the nine lesser and the three greater rites. The nine lesser rites being the symbolical rites of generation the three greater rites of regeneration. Therefore, by nine months and three degrees, a man is made perfect. 
This is a very curious symbolism, but it has a great deal of interest if we know how to study it. In other words, the individual to pass through the second birth must go through the womb of the mysteries to complete the circle of which nine parts only are provided in generation. The Chinese, fully aware of that, declare a child to be one year old after it has reached the third month. It celebrates its first birthday three months after it is born. This is part of a, of a very curious doctrine, but it points to the three winter or fall months leading toward final death. It is to do with the blinding of Samson, the cutting off of the rays of the sun god, also has to do, as Leonardo da Vinci points out in his astronomical calculation of the Last Supper, for the painting is a very strangely astute piece of work. And each of the apostles and each of the positions and groupings, you will find the apostles are grouped in triplicities, exactly like the signs. And the sign of Scorpio is assigned to Judas. Now, why should the sign of Scorpio be assigned to Judas? In the Orient, there is something about the scorpion that is very peculiar. First of all, it stings with its tail. Therefore, it is the backbiter. The second thing that is about it that is strange is that the mark which it leaves is always in the form of a minute pair of human lips. The kiss of death. The kiss of betrayal. So that was the sign that was used to signify the destroyer, Typhon, who is also responsible for the destruction of the good god Osiris. The sign of the scorpion, however, in the ancient rituals has three meanings. Three creatures have been assigned to it down through the ages. And depending upon the one that is selected, uh, you have some concept of the true meaning of it. The scorpion is the one, is one sign that is associated with it. The second sign that is associated with it is the serpent. The third sign that is associated with it is the phoenix. So the scorpion, the serpent, and the phoenix were all given to that one sign of the zodiac. 